Hey mom, did you know that there's a Momxiety Club membership? When you join, you'll get access to a wonderfully supportive group of moms where you can ask whatever questions or just vent if that's what you need. There's also weekly exercise classes to give your body and mind a little boost so you are refreshed for the rest of the week. And if you can't make it live, you can get access to all the replays in the members area. If you're listening to this podcast, I'm confident that it's a fit for you. To make it accessible for everyone, it's less than $10 a month. Plus, throughout the month of December, the cost of membership for all new moms to join the Momxiety Club will be donated to the Children's Miracle Network. I'm extending you this offer to join other moms like you around the world saying goodbye to their Momxiety together. Just head to join.momxietyclub.com and click the Join the Momxiety Club membership. I can't wait to see you there. Welcome to the Momxiety Club podcast. I'm your host, Tori Levine, a former mental health worker with degrees in psychology and criminal justice, so I know the importance of keeping calm in a difficult situation. But when I had my kids, I found myself full of anxiety. One day, everything clicked and I made a commitment to own my anxiety so it doesn't own me. And that's why I started the Momxiety Club podcast. Each week, we'll discuss the ups, the downs, and anxieties of motherhood. So join me and let's get rid of this Momxiety together. Welcome to episode 24 of the Momxiety Club podcast. This is the last episode of 2020, and while the interview you are going to hear today with Rabbi Ariana Kaptauber was recorded a few months ago in November, I thought it would be most relevant to come out around the new year because we discuss many life changes that happened all at once for Rabbi Kaptauber, as well as she spoke during Rosh Hashanah about forgiveness, and I think that is very fitting for this time of year as well. So if you're unfamiliar, Rosh Hashanah is the Jewish New Year, and so you can see where my thought process was to have this come out New Year's Eve 2020. Uh, Just as in previous episodes, links to social media, email, and the Momxiety Club website are included in the show notes. The Momxiety Club email subscribers get a link to the latest episodes and show notes in the weekly email. So if you're not already on the list, you can get added by signing up for the free resources at join.momxietyclub.com. Also, a little reminder to subscribe in your favorite podcast app that you listen to on your phone or just tell your smart speaker to play the Momxiety Club podcast um, whenever you're ready. All right. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Rabbi Ariana Kaptauber. Enjoy. Enjoy. Thank you so much for joining me. How are you? I'm good. Yeah. Um, Your listeners might hear a little bit of cooing in the background because I'm doing my working mom juggling of uh, work and momming and Yona, my baby is here in the room with me. Yes, I just heard and it is adorable. So Uh, it's too bad we can't see him and this is just for our ears, but <laughs> we can imagine how adorable the little baby is. He'll so, pipe in when he has something important to say. Good, good. <laughs> All right. So I want to just tell the listeners, you just had a brand new baby. You had a lot of life changes happening all at once, which I thought was a great topic for us to discuss and kind of share your experiences. But do you want to just give us a little rundown of you, what's been going on, what all these big changes are, so that we kind of can get a grasp of how you've been handling everything amazingly with a newborn? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so as you said, I'm Ariana Kaptauber. Um, perhaps the first change in the order of things that happened was I was just ordained in May. So I just started beca- becoming a rabbi on an official level, although I had been working as a rabbi before that in New York. Um, then I moved in June from New York, where I was living and going to rabbinical school and working, to 
Harrisburg, PA, which is my new home. I really like it. I live in Midtown. Um, and then after that, I went from my newly moved in home in Harrisburg to Maryland, where I am from. And um, I was staying there with my parents while I waited to give birth, which happened in late July, July 22nd, my baby was born. So I had just started my new job as Bethel in Harrisburg's rabbi on July 1st, which I was sort of doing remotely, oddly enough. Um, although in these pandemic days, that's kind of how a lot of things happen. I was attending all my meetings and prayer services online. And then all that stopped when my baby was born July 22nd. And I went on maternity leave for um, around six weeks. And then I had to jump back in because it was time for the high holidays. And um, those happened at the end of September. So we jumped right into a new year. So I um, at that point, I was back living in Harrisburg again. So now I am newly a rabbi, a mom, a Harrisburg resident, and the rabbi of Bethel all at once, getting to know lots of things, new job, new home, new life with baby, and uh, lots of transitions all at once. Well, at least from the outside, looking in, you've been handling everything very gracefully. Something that I said about this moment of transition in my sermon on the first day of Rosh Hashanah was actually that sometimes I don't even know what I'm supposed to be called because in some circumstances I'm, you know, mom or mommy and some circumstances I'm Ariana, some circumstances I'm Rabbi Kaptauber or just Rabbi. And I think having all these different names is really emblematic of where I am at this moment in my life that I really have a lot of different hats, so to speak, and even names. And sometimes I just have to ground myself for a moment and remember, what am I being called <laughs> in this moment? <laughs> Um, and I think it's actually relevant to kind of how I feel about doing this interview, which is that I'm, it's an interesting kind of blending where I'm speaking about myself as a mom, but I'm also being called on because I'm a rabbi. Um, and it's a, it's an interesting blending where I'm figuring out sort of as I'm speaking, what's appropriate to talk about as a rabbi and what am I sharing as a mom? So it's, yeah, even in this very moment, doing some <laughs> blending of my different hats and figuring out what to be called. <laughs> sort of being, being able to stay open-minded to what each day will bring and to know that everything is going to feel totally new all the time and not be surprised by the newness is, is helpful and not, you know, and to find little measures of control and stability and schedule where I can, but um, to know that to just take each thing as it comes for as long as I can. Right. And it, it, it's, I'm sure, challenging to have everything at once, but also I think it can lend to it because you're just like more able to say, this is how it is and take one thing at a time. <laughs> yeah. And also, you know, speaking of forgiveness, I think that that there's a way that people know that because I'm going through so many things that are new at the same time that I've, I feel that I've been given a lot of forgiveness and leeway, which makes me feel more comfortable. And actually I think ends up making me able to thrive more. So the more I feel that people know that I'm going through a lot of new things at once and are able to kind of forgive the, the failure to answer emails right away or whatever it is, um, or to arrive on time to things. Um, the, I think I have some forgiveness built in because people know I'm going through a lot of transitions at once. And that's really helpful. Oh, that's, that's, that's good. Yeah. For sure. There were times when it was overwhelming. I think that maybe the first, you know, on the earlier level, when I experienced the overwhelm was, um, when I was waiting to give birth, <laughs> you know, nice. Very excited about yes. this voice right now. Um, I was I was waiting to give birth 
And I was, I went a little past 40 weeks and I ended up being induced. I hadn't wanted to be induced. Um, and I was really trying to wait as long as I could, but I went to the doctor um, at, you know, close to 41 weeks and they said, you know, it's probably medically best for you to be induced at this point. And um, that's when I was feeling kind of overwhelmed because it was my first time and I was nervous about giving birth. And I also, um, you know, hadn't wanted to be induced and didn't know what that would mean and for my birth experience. But at the same time, I knew I wanted to be able to take as much maternity leave as I could. And I knew I kind of had this hard stop of the high holidays where I was going to have to go back um, about a week, at least a week before I had wanted to go back two weeks before. So I knew that the longer Yona was taking to be born, um, the less time I was going to have with him once he was out of the womb. So um so that was, that was a pretty overwhelming time. That was a very intense time. Um, and I was having a lot of Braxton Hicks contractions. And so every night it was like, tonight is the night. Right. <laughs> um, and it never was the night. <laughs> so, um, you know, I would, I would go to sleep and wake up in the morning and be like, oh, I guess I didn't have a baby. So <laughs> right. I, um, I actually, that, kind of that yeah. is, even though my youngest is 20 months that still seems like forever ago to me but I at the same time remember that and I'm sure everybody who's listening can very much identify with that where if you're overdue it's like okay let's go and mm -hmm. even though in our brains we can know all the like the science and like the dates aren't specific it's not anything like that our emotions kick in and are just like okay this needs to happen why is this not happening <laughs> So completely, completely. Yeah, it was really stressful. So that was a time, but it was also, I think that was when I first also started to marshal, you know, the, the spiritual resources that I had, which was, um, you know, I've done some meditation practice and done, med you know, silent meditation retreats. And so really just um, leaning into the skills of just patience and waiting to see what will unfold and accepting things as they are and not as I had hoped they would be. Um, and also, you know, um, two summers ago, so in, in early on in my meditation experience, a lot of what my teachers were talking about was opening up to emotions, but then later on in a, in a more recent meditation retreat experience that I had, it was about finding equanimity and that when those emotions come, how do we manage ourselves? So we're not overwhelmed. So we're not feeling too much to even know what's going on. And so I was really sort of looking to find that equanimity whenever I would have a wave of anxiety of why isn't this baby coming? And I'm so overwhelmed. And what is it going to mean for my future? I would sort of remind myself that that was just an emotion and that I was going to be okay. And um, I was going to, you know, find solidness and equanimity again. Um, there was something else that just occurred to me. Oh, I know. I think also, I remember feeling nervous about giving birth, you know, just about what that was going to be like. And there was something about, I, I had always been afraid of it before I even got pregnant. And then later on in my pregnancy, there was this feeling of, well, it's inevitable. It's just going to have to happen, right? The baby's going to have right. to come <laughs> one way or another. So I think that there's something spiritual about that as well. Like this idea of fate, you know, that, that sometimes we can't see what our fate is, that it's out there in front of us, but we don't, we have no idea. But when you are pregnant with a baby, there is like your fate of, you know, birthing that, that being one way or another, whatever, whatever happens beyond that, um, you know, that, that there's a kind of inevitability and a, and a sense of fate with that, that kind of, for me, helped me just lean in and feel a little bit calmer and a little less nervous about it. You just gave a nice calm sigh too. <laughs> <laughs> As for my practice these days, I think I, I often was telling myself that I 
wanted to get back into it and that doing meditation every day would be so useful in the early days after Yona was born. And I just really couldn't. I was, you know, it was, there was so much going on. I kept telling myself to do it. It's only really now recently, like the last week or two, he's three months old, um, that I'm sort of just creeping back into a regular spiritual and meditation and prayer practice um, that it, it feels sort of my life has settled enough that I can, that I can get back into it. But I still think that I was using those tools a lot, even, you know, when giving birth and afterward practicing, bringing my mind back to my breath, um, being able to find grounding when things felt like just they were crashing over me in waves. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I think meditation was really helpful and, and prayer practice is kind of that way as well. Um, having a regular prayer practice is like a reminder to take a moment out of your day, out of the craziness and sort of come back, set an intention, connect to whatever you connect to spiritually, you know, even having a moment in prayer where you're sort of asking God for things or asking the universe for things reminds you what you want, you know, what you're looking for, what you need. Um, and I find that really helpful. The, the very last thing that you said, which I find meditative for me is when I get a chance to sit and really study something um, so how you're relating that if I'm reading a book about mindfulness, if I'm reading a book about, I'm a big psychology neuroscience person. So I love to understand those things. So even that it's just focusing in on myself, learning about these different <laughs> things that are occurring within, um, as well as attending prayer services and obviously this is across all faiths that that can be a time when you are looking within, but also asking for assistance. Uh, and I think that people maybe not think of that as meditation, um, but there's such a broad definition now. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, right. Yeah. People talk about meditation and really, in really broad ways and it's become kind of a pop phenomenon. So um, I think that, you know, apps and things you can do for five minutes are really useful and also to sort of really get deeper into the experience and to, um, to understand what it's about more fully. It kind of takes a longer term mm -hmm. practice. Um, but I will say that, you know, one thing that meditation is really helpful for is noticing your own mind. And I'm kind of noticing even in this moment, how I feel like the last response that I gave was kind of scattered and all over the place a little bit. And I think that that's really been an effect of this period of my life where, there's so much going on and there's so many things to do. It's really hard to settle my mind at any time. And I kind of even just noticed that all, even, even noticing that can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Just like thinking, wow, I'm like, my mind is racing. I'm trying to think of what to do at any given moment. I can't relax, you know, and even just noticing that can be really helpful, which is, I think something that meditation has taught me to do, but you know, I feel like on my free day, I'm thinking, okay, what, what does Yona need? What is the, like, how can I finish unpacking the house? What do I, you know, do, what do I need to be doing for my job? What do I need to be doing for myself? You know, and my mind is so incredibly scattered right now because of that. It is. And I, I think one of the key parts is like you're saying, just noticing that. And it is very challenging, especially where you are postpartum still, there's so many hormones still fluctuating up, down, left, right, um, that that adds to the scattered brain because, well, you and I know lots of moms who have to go back to work right away, they, there's this whole balancing act that... I want to say <laughs> naturally is just adding on to everything. Like our hormones are not quite there yet. We're not ready to take on that whole thing. They are all here saying, okay, what does this child need? What do I need to do to so feed, love, support this child? But then 
modern day world, we're adding in lots of other things. So it's completely normal. And some people may not even realize, but, you know, people say like they need their shower. Like that can be, that was what I would say is like the meditative self-care settling my mind moment. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think that we can use all kinds of moments like that to find meditation. And I, I think that's something also that my practice taught me is like, you can meditate while you're doing the dishes, you know, and it will remind me also, I think that my mind looks for stimulation all the time. And I'm always like, oh, I'm just taking a walk right now. Why don't I listen to a podcast or like, mm-hmm. I'm just sitting around right now. Why don't I, you know, watch TV or read articles or whatever. And, um, I think that spiritual practice has reminded me that you can actually just walk in silence (laughs) or you can actually just sit for a few minutes and just look at your baby and not be stimulated in any other way. Um, And that ends up, I think, affording me some of the most keyed in moments that I have in my day. Okay. Now that is the key takeaway. And that is, that's one of the things I try to talk about with moms as well is there's so much content. We are just being bombarded with everything and trying to know that it's okay to take that time to just say no to all the (laughs) bombardment of things from outside and just that time for ourselves. Um, That kind of lends into the next question and the other topic. For the High Holidays for Rosh Hashanah, you had some really great sermons that kind of tied into what I had just talked about on some of the episodes and a lot of things that I think moms are continually working on is like mom guilt, mom shame. When we're not doing all the things, when we're not 100% perfect for everyone all the time, I think it's very easy for moms, especially recovering perfectionists (laughs) to (laughs) uh, think like, well, I feel guilty because I'm not doing that. Or, and then kind of what I discussed in a previous episode, which I'll link to um, if anybody wants to listen to that in the show notes is, are we really feeling that mom guilt or has it crossed over into that borderline of shame? And, you know, everybody talks about mom shaming. Well, I think one of the bigger issues is, is not mom shaming others, you know, but it's mom shame ourselves that we're. I'm saying I'm a bad mom because I had to take five minutes to look at something for myself, or I'm a bad mom because I did not 100% give my children every single span of my attention today, all the waking hours of the day. (laughs) Um, So that was really key with what you talked about with forgiveness, because we have to be able to accept that we're not perfect and forgive ourselves so that we can then take that time, those self-care reflective times so that we can be better there for ourselves, our children, our families, and so on. So um, could you share a little bit about your what you talked about with forgiveness? Yeah, I think that they're really connected actually, forgiveness and what we were talking about with mindfulness before, because it's about Um, as Sharon Salzberg says, who I quoted in that sermon that you're talking about, um, she's an author of a lot of books about mindfulness. And um, she says it's about accepting things as they are. And I think accepting things as they are is something that comes with mindfulness and, you know, being aware of our own minds. We want things to be this way. We, We are regretful that things weren't that way. But in fact, just being with things as they are in the moment is sort of the first step also to achieving forgiveness for ourselves or forgiveness for um, for others who are frustrating us in our attempt to achieve perfection, um, as you so aptly put it. I think you know a lot of I think a lot of forgiveness in my experience with motherhood so far is about my expectations and life not meeting my expectations 
and how do we deal with the gap between our expectations and how things end up in reality. And I think especially for me as a first time mom, you know, just in the beginning of it, I'm coming up against a lot of expectations. I mean, there's a lot of things as about being a mom that I never even knew existed, right? So that I didn't have necessarily an expectation about it, but then, but there's a lot of things that I didn't even realize I had expectations about based on, you know, how my own mother was or other moms that I've seen in my friends or, you know, people in the media and, you know, culturally our expectations, things I didn't even realize I had an expectation about that then I realized I did. And also at the same time in finding that I don't meet that expectation and how do I deal with that gap and dealing with that gap, I think is where forgiveness comes in. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that the things that have been so far, the biggest gaps for me in terms of how I hoped or expected it would be and how I, how it actually is. Um, first of the first thing was with breastfeeding that I had attended a natural mama birthing class before I, um, before I gave birth with a woman who I totally adore, who was actually a former congregant and they just really talked up breastfeeding you know, and said, sort of put forth all the information we now know know about how healthy it is for babies and how, you know, it can promote, you know, it's associated with everything from infant mother bonding to, you know, greater intelligence and all this kind of things. Um, And so, and I really, really wanted to breastfeed. I have to say that I had a lot of fear that it wasn't going to happen in the way that I wanted to, even before I gave birth, I was, I was worried about that. And in fact, it didn't. Um, and I had a lot of pain, just like a lot of complications with it. And ultimately the main thing was I just didn't have enough milk. And so, you know, we had sort of scary moments at the beginning where it seemed like, you know, he was drying out and he wasn't gaining enough weight and all this kind of stuff. And so we slowly had to start to introduce and then really rely on formula. Um, and I, I still, I sort of pushed through, I was not very forgiving with myself and I like really pushed through a lot of difficulty with it. And at this point now, thank God it's going better, but I'm still not able to, I still breastfeed, but I'm not able to give Yona everything he needs. So he still gets bottles of formula. And, um, that was something that, you know, I really, my expectations and my hope for how breastfeeding was going to go and how it did go. There was a huge gap between that. And I think I'm still struggling with forgiveness for myself that like forgiveness for my body, you know, that, um, that it's not performing exactly the way I'd hoped. I think that that happened also actually with with waiting to give birth that, you know, that I was wishing that my body would just do its thing right. you know, by itself earlier on. And, um, and it didn't. And so I think I'm finding that I'm using all my mindfulness tools that we talked about before to try to accept things as they are and not, and not be so hard on myself for the way I had wanted them to be, you know? And I I think the moment that I actually came around that to the moat to that the most was when a friend said, you know, and, and whatever, she had trouble with breastfeeding, but from the opposite perspective, you know, she had too much or whatever, but she said, ultimately fed is best, right? You know? So that, that this is what's going through because I say that all the time too. Yes. They should eat. (laughs) Yes. Um, and hearing that actually was kind of just like a big release happened, I think. And even when I said now it was like, okay, (laughs) fed is best. Um, and I think I spoke about in my sermon also this need to be able to forgive ourselves before we can forgive others, you know, and I, I was holding on to some some tension and anxiety towards the teachers of that class that I took. And I was like, why didn't they tell me that it could be so hard? And I think it wasn't until I was able to forgive myself that I was able to really think about being able to forgive 
you know, forgive others who had perhaps set my expectations um, differently than than it than what ended up matching reality. I remember I I in that sermon I told a story about um, a rabbi who wants to be forgiven by someone who's he's offended, and so he goes and waits outside that other person's house for days until finally. Um, and now Yona is upset with me. It sounds like, um, until finally, um, a maid one day dumps the waste basket out the window and it lands right on this guy. And he says, Oh, I'm a trash heap. Um, and so this rabbi, I say, you know, on the one hand, the fact that the person who he asked to forgive him did not come around to forgiveness sooner that's not commendable. But I think that this story is saying also that we can't just beat ourselves up, up so much that we're sitting around waiting to be forgiven by others, waiting to be forgiven by society for not meeting expectations um, and, you know, end up becoming covered in trash, you know? Right. That That's a good, go get him. <laughs> no, a second, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you go get him. Just dropping in to let you know that this is the last week for you to take advantage of the year-end sale at join.momsietyclub.com. Do you feel stressed and overwhelmed more often than not? Do you feel like you're in the middle of a circus and there's just chaos going on around you? You are not alone. Schedule your one-on-one -on -one session now. You'll walk away with a personalized action plan on how to relieve your stress and momsiety when you are in the middle of it. Head to join.momsietyclub.com and use the code YEARENT to schedule your one-on-one -on -one session now before this sale is over. You won't want to miss it. I was waiting for that shoe to drop with the... <laughs> the yeah, that's the... the hungry. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, I just, so I just want to share that some of what you had discussed with forgiving yourself and kind of the expectations that you had set up while for your, for your body for while waiting to give birth, I definitely had those same exact things. And I think it's hardest for first time moms because you have that expectation. I know where we are with the hospital where I delivered, there were all these classes to go to the childbirth, the, you know, baby 101 <laughs> breastfeeding classes. And we, we did all that. And I think that if there are new moms or soon to be new moms listening, that a thing that we could, that would have benefited me and possibly kind of sounds like you are feeling as well is that they're presenting the best case scenario. And we have to understand that that is not always going to happen. And it is not always how it goes for everyone. We, yeah, I was induced, had the same thing, you know, with, I didn't have like, you know, presenting a whole high, high holiday <laughs> service to everybody, but I was a bridesmaid in my best friend's wedding. So we had to travel and he was supposed to be six weeks. It ended up, he was five weeks. And that was the anxiety that was coming from that. And I was like, okay, well, my body's not, it's not time yet, <laughs> but we're going to do this. And then this similar things with breastfeeding. Um, and I, I think that was easier for me the first time around with, uh, having that expectation. Cause I went about it the same way as I was pregnant. Everybody was asking, are you going to breastfeed? Are you going to do this? And I would answer, I'm going to try. That was, that was, I know I set myself up for a good expectation for that, but still when there were issues, it was hard. And so I would say those are the key differences that it is a lot harder the first time around because we're presented with this you know, best case scenario of how things can be. And it's hard. People don't talk about the challenges a lot. They're not as open to talking about the challenges. So that is, again, one of the main points of having this podcast is to help new moms through those challenging times that aren't talked about enough, because that will then, that can then, then lead to, you know, I can't do it. I'm not good enough, which 
you know, that may have not been what you were thinking. There were definitely, I could feel some undertones, you know, like, why isn't my body cooperating? Those types of things and thinking everybody else can do it, um, which is not something that we need added on mentally with everything else that's going on as a new mom. (laughs) So, um, I wanted to, speaking of everything else that's going on as a new mom. Um, so part of finding this balance with working and being a new mom, one other place that kind of had a big gap between expectations of a certain kind and how it actually is, is, um, that I'm the parent that's gone back to work and my husband is the parent who's staying home, at least for now. Um, The reason that Yona is with me today is he's actually just going out for a job interview and he's starting to look for work. But for these first months, um, he was the one that was staying home because I had a job that just needed me to be back and he didn't. And I think that... um, it's been really interesting kind of figuring out what our own expectations looked like and the gap between that and what's actually happened as well as other people's, you know, people will often ask him, Oh, what do you do? What are, you know, what are you doing? And, and sort of the expression on people's face sometimes when, when he says, Oh, I'm an at home dad, you know, Um, and, and also his own desire to, you know, there's a lot of infrastructure for moms that stay home or there's more infrastructure for moms that stay home, um, you know, mommy groups and that kind of thing online and in person, et cetera. And there isn't as much support like that for dads. And, um, and so I think the fact that society is sort of really built up or, and kind of an infrastructure around the possibility that dads will be working and moms will be home, which is great. Um, um, but doesn't have as much structure around when it goes the other way. Um, makes it hard for us, for those of us who are in that position to kind of forgive ourselves for ha- for that being the way it is. You know, so I, as a mom, I feel like, oh, I'm the one that's supposed to be home. I'm not with him enough. I'm like leaving him with my husband. And there's a kind of a guilt that comes from that because it's not the expectation, right? It's like, I should be home with him more because I'm the mom. Um, And so there's like a need for forgiveness for ourselves as well as for him, you know, maybe feeling sometimes some guilt, like, oh, I'm the dad, I should be out working. I should be like making the money or or whatever it is. And um, the fact that it's not like that, maybe that gap requires some, some forgiveness. Um, And I, I think that is kind of a, a process that happens on a societal level mm-hmm. as us to different norms, but also that has to happen on a personal and family level. And I think the more that I think it was weird for me at first, as much as I am a feminist and, and knew that this was how it was going to be and was okay with it in theory, I think when it actually started and I was back at work and Baruch, my husband, was the one that was home with Yona all the time, um, I did feel weirdness around it. And especially when we were coming up against other people's expectations, people meeting us for the first time and finding out that that was how we were doing things. Um but as I've seen how well it's working and how, you know, well Yona is cared for and how cozy we are kind of in our dynamic and thank God, you know, this job as a, my job as a rabbi is quite flexible in the sense that I have my own office and um, the baby can be with me sometimes and Baruch could bring him over to feed or, you know, I could go home at various hours and come back to work at different hours. And there was a lot of flexibility. So it's working fine. Um, and thank God we could afford for, you know, for Baruch to be home for now. But, um, you know, with all of that, I think as I was seeing how well it was working and how Yona was thriving with it, I was able to find more acceptance of our family structure as it was instead of how I thought maybe it should be or how other families were or how I wished it were, et cetera. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> uh, everything you're saying, I think I definitely understand and can relate to. And I think a lot of the times what we as a society forget is that, yes, there are societal norms, but 
we have to do what works for us. And as you were talking, I said that I, I tell that to moms all the time when they're talking about breastfeeding, formula feeding, say fed is best and you have to do what works for you. Uh, with how they set up, you know, the baby in their room, what toys and things they need and the headed back to work. One of the big things is that they're, everybody's different. Some people really thrive on having that time one-on-one with their child all the time. Some people really thrive when they get to go to work part-time and (laughs) come back and then they have more time um, engaging with their child. Some people thrive best when they are full-time in a very demanding job. It all, like you have to know yourself first to know how that goes. I've been all over the spectrum of stay at home, part-time business, you know, in and out. And I know now, even though I felt guilty about it for so long, for me to be the best mom I can be, I need time to use my brain as an adult. (laughs) So, um, and then there's always those times that creep back and go, no, I should really just be doing this. I need to just be at home. And then I I go and my husband goes, yeah, that doesn't work for you. Then everybody's miserable (laughs) because you're miserable. So knowing yourself, and again, that goes back to that meditation as knowing yourself to know what works best for your family. Yeah. Yeah. And I think hearing stories from other moms about how things really are, as opposed to how, you know, they appear in the magazines or whatever Mm -hmm. um, is really, is really important. I think I, I was helped enormously with the notion of going back to work by having, you know, heard from a friend of mine who's a mom and who also is working clergy Say, who said, you know, I actually, I had a nice long maternity leave and then I felt good and ready to go back to work by the end of it. And I think hearing that gave me permission from the outset to feel however I was going to feel. If I felt like, oh, I really wish that I could have had more time at home and I want to figure out how to make more time for that, that will be fine. And if I feel like, no, I really would like to have some space and go back to work and have an, a grown up brain, et cetera. Right. Um, then that's also okay, you know? And I think hearing that story and having that permission to feel whatever I was going to feel because I knew that there were other moms who had the same experience um, was really, really big and helped my transition a lot. I'm glad you had that. And hopefully somebody listening will, this will be their permission as well. What I like to ask guests, and this is also something like we do in, in the Mom Society Club group is talk about, you know, what was something that you did for yourself today? Um, this was not today. I think it was yesterday, but, um, I used to like to paint my nails and I hadn't, I realized recently that I hadn't had my nails painted since like a month before Yona was born, which, so it's been like four months. And I was like, ah, I really, it's not something that I need to do obviously. And it's not something I feel a lot of pressure around doing. It's kind of just a fun thing that I like to, I like colors. And so I was like, Oh, what color do I feel like today? And, and it's one of those things that I'm always like, Oh, I'll do it later. I'll do it later. Mm -hmm. And then three months go by or whatever. Yeah. (laughs) And so, yeah, the other day I just did it. (laughs) Well, that's good. And before bed squeezed it in, you know, and uh, now they're done and I look at them and I feel feel better. <laughs> yeah. And say, and then you look down and that gives you a nice little boost if you need it sometimes too. Right. And it's, it just felt like something that I did just so purely for myself as mm-hmm. with anyone else. So that was really nice. That's nice. And I mean, you have shared a lot. I know what you had just talked about with giving yourself permission was some great advice, but is there anything different any advice you would have given yourself as a new mom now looking back, you're still a brand new mom. <laughs> and I say you still will be for a couple of years. <laughs> um, that's just how I look at it. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because as a rabbi, you would think I would have this more on lockdown, but um, just believing 
you know, really having belief in the possibility of a positive outcome with things, the possibility of things getting better, I think is really important. Um, and, you know, obviously if I could have told myself three months ago that things would work out fine when, especially with the breastfeeding, there was a lot of pain or when I was anxious about the balance between work and and being a mom and seeing myself now and and seeing how those things are working out fine, being able to just believe that it's possible, that it will work out well, I think is really important. You know, um, it's actually, it's funny because I'm obviously very into religion and my husband is less so, but um, it was he that said to me, you know, you have to believe in your breast milk, believe in, you know, believe that it will work out. And, And when he said that to me, I said, Wow, yeah, I really, I really should be more optimistic, and I, I, I usually am a more optimistic person, so I should apply that here as well. So I think just being, just but being able to believe that things will work out well in the end is um, really helpful. That that is very helpful. Well, thank you again so much for everything, uh, sharing your wisdom and your time. Take care. Bye bye. If you're interested in hearing more or learning more from Rabbi Ariana Kaptauber, you can head to the website that is listed in the show notes, and there are some links to her writing as well as some of her speaking, and there's also some links to some of the other things we discussed in this conversation, like a link to Sharon Salzberg, who she quoted. So just head to the show notes for any of those links. Well, thank you again to Rabbi Ariana Kaptauber for sharing her her journey with multiple changes all at once and talking about meditation, mindfulness, and forgiveness of ourselves. I would love to hear your takeaways. Are you able to recognize that you had set expectations that are unmet by how things actually are? Do you find that these unmet expectations are leading to tons of mom guilt or even shame. Um, If any of this resonates with you, I would be honored to assist you either via the Momxiety Club membership or through working one-on-one together. So around New Year, you know, this is the time when people are making resolutions And I think resolutions kind of set us up for failure because we say we're not going to eat cake or we're going to go to the gym every single day or we're we're not going to get frustrated and raise our voices with our kids. Um, So I don't want to say a resolution, but what I've been working on is having a word or like a goal or visualization of something of calm for how I want things to be in the coming year. Um, so I'd love to hear yours. My word that I'm focusing on is movement. I want to move myself. I want to help you help moms everywhere use movement to manage anxiety. Um, and I'm not talking about exercise, exercise, exercise. It's just very simple things, little movements, um, that, will assist us in boosting our mood and to help connect with others, bond with your child. And in classes online, you have that great connection with other moms or just when you're one-on-one with me to assist with that movement that we're working on. Yeah, so movement is my word that I'm focusing on. I'd love to hear yours. So you can email me at hello at momsietyclub.com or you can leave a voicemail, join.momxietyclub.com. There's a little leave a voicemail tab. Make sure you subscribe to the Momxiety Club podcast in your favorite podcast app. Leave a rating and review and share with a new mom friend because knowing that you are not the only one feeling like this is so 
helpful. If you are on the Momsiety Club email list, you'll get weekly emails about the podcast as well as access to free resources. And you can join the email list at join.momsietyclub.com and signing up for our free resources there. All right, I am wishing you some relaxation, some realistic self-care, and a joyful end of the year. And until next time, I will catch you inside of the Momsiety Club membership. All right, Mama, you are not alone. The Momsiety Club podcast is not intended to take place of medical advice or therapy. If you are in crisis, call your local emergency number or the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. The Momsiety Club membership is full of a group of amazingly supportive moms and pre- and postnatal fitness tips and exercises to help you mentally and physically. The first month's fee for all new members this month is being donated to the Children's Miracle Network. When you're ready to join other mamas getting through the ups, downs, and anxieties of motherhood, head to join.momsietyclub.com to become a member and check out the year-end sale going on for working with me individually, plus access to the Momsiety Club in the Ultimate Momsiety Relief Package.